Hi, I'm Ben Messimer with Pearl River Eco Design, and this is my really good friend Charlie Roselle. Together, we share a 10 acre homestead in southern Mississippi and make maps together. We work in this little design studio in my little cabin in the woods, and together we make maps and animations to help some of the world's leading educators and design specialists. We don't just want to make maps of landscapes, on a more macro level, we also would like to help map out what it's going to take to shift paradigms to a world that's filled with life and meaning. If someone gave you like a really large amount of money, you know, and, and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, power to make some, you know, large scale changes, what, what would you see as the leverage points? Like what would you do if, you know, you had whatever, $50 billion and, you know, 100 square miles or, or whatever it is of degraded landscape like what what do you feel like is the the you know least effort for the greatest change that that you would see doing over uh, large scale landscapes to restore uh, the hydrologic cycle the ecosystem soil organic matter all those things there's no limits right and um, and and I, i've got total choice um the first thing I would do is I work with my team. I have a very large team. I'm very lucky. I've taught a lot of students and a lot of them become very active and they come to me with their skills. So I'm extremely fortunate that I'm very much a team player. So all you see is me at the front here, but there's 26 plus people behind me doing all kinds of things. And one of my best starting points and always today is my mapping expert, Ben Missima. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I just uh, talked uh, to Ben uh, yesterday. <laughs> Pearl River Eco Design. He has been one of my best assets. Yeah. I mean, Bill, Bill Mollison always said, maps are one of our most important tools. Now I've got LIDAR. Now I've got Ben enhancing LIDAR. Um, I, I started mapping with Ben when he maps a tuna farm from America without telling me and then sent me the design, it blew me away. Yeah. I just, I, I've been a map freak all my life. I love maps. You know, you know, Ben does the animations on my videos now. So he yeah, actually I mean, also can do, he can make the maps move as well. He's really exceptional. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he has invested his life skills and all his financial skills. We need to, I, I don't know what would happen if I lost Ben. And I don't know what I would do without the help and support of my childhood best friend and mapping buddy, Charlie Roselle, or the care and support from our families. If you want a path to a viable retirement, if you want to eat nutritious food and have food security and food sovereignty, if you want a legacy and not a nightmare to hand down to your children, I think you'll appreciate the rest of the presentation I've put together for you.
I've worked nonstop over the past few years developing my workflow and sizable portfolio. I've had to acquire many new skills as well as draw from my past experiences. So straight out of high school, I joined the Navy and I worked as an aviation electronics technician for eight years. I worked on helicopters and all sorts of electronics equipment. When I got out in 2006, I took an eight-month carpentry program at my local community college and built three homes from the ground up. I really wanted to use my background in electronics and apply it to the construction industry to do smart home technologies. But during 2008, the Great Recession hit and the construction industry tanked, which dramatically changed my trajectory. So I went back to school to get a two-year degree in electronics engineering technology to bolster my military training and experience. After I left the military, I became addicted to documentaries and explored a lot of unsettling ones. I gained not just a deeper understanding of our economic situation, but a clearer understanding of history and challenges that lay ahead of us. It was a dark time, and I couldn't see a bright future for my family. I was scared and I felt lost. I started to research survival methods and joined prepper groups that were actually trying to shield themselves from all sorts of potential threats. I was driven to find security and comfort somehow. It was through those channels that I stumbled across permaculture. While I was going to college, I worked as a janitor at night, and as I cleaned the campus, I would listen to podcasts. And I really liked this one called The Survival Podcast with Jack Spirico, and he always had this pleasant sign off. He'd say, helping you live a better life if times get tough or even if they don't. And that was a really pleasing sentiment that I chased. And uh, you know, one evening he, he was talking about this guy named Jeff Lawton who created an oasis in the middle of a desert. And he said that if, if he could do it there, we could do it anywhere. And that really clicked and I was I went out and I consumed everything that Jeff had put together and, and Bill Mollison and David Holmgren. And I, it was a pivotal moment in my life where I went from just consuming problem-oriented documentaries to everything that was solution-oriented. Uh, permaculture, alternative dwellings, renewable energy, anything that would help create independence. I wanted to use my newly acquired degree in automation and somehow apply it towards agriculture. I also took a class in solar panels and solar hot water heating systems and I wanted to work somewhere in the renewable energy field. So I got a job working for a marine electronics company and then eventually I worked for the Port of New Orleans. I was finally making enough to get some land. We found a 10 acre piece of land in southern Mississippi which is about an hour and a half commute for me. I found myself stuck at work three to five days a week though and I had to sleep on an air mattress. So in 2015 I suffered a workplace injury that left me required to have a spinal fusion and I was bedridden for over a year and a half. And it was during that time that I saw Jeff Lawton was offering an online permaculture design course. I couldn't have come at a better time for me because I needed to reboot on the, on the other side of this. And then I upgraded my design studio and started practicing permaculture designs with the aid of my drone. Using drones was cool and all, but the tree canopy returns and the thick vegetation really obscured the terrain below and was a pain to work around. I soon discovered LiDAR data though, which gave me the ability to be able to see through all the trees and vegetation. I went all in on learning how to manipulate LiDAR data and develop useful visual aids to prime my permaculture design with. Very soon after I started getting a handle on it, I was wondering, I wonder if Jeff has LiDAR data in his area. It turned out he did, so then I worked up a series of maps that covered his entire town and I sent them to him. Uh, I wanted to show him what we could be leveraging when we're assessing landscapes. He, he invited me to come work with his consultancy team. And since then, we've done dozens of projects around the world now. And uh, beyond that, I've done over 100 maps. And I've also been featured at Esri's annual convention. And they've published my work in their annual um, 
their annual Book of Maps. I'm truly honored to be able to be working alongside my hero and with many other permaculture designers out there in the world. But we have a short window of opportunity for us to be able to affect change in a timely manner. The amount of just environmental degradation and loss of life, the aquifers being pumped dry, and everything else that is, you know, if we fail on any one of those measures, that is a wrap. But we have the design science, we have the technology to be able to model our landscapes and, to, and give marching orders to the 7 billion occupants of this planet. And we could terraform this into in just a ridiculous state of abundance. I, I can see it clearly. I'm going to be talking about some of the situations that we need to face and more importantly ways that we can deal with them.
You know, it's just, it's one of those things where as it's all playing out, there's this sense of hopelessness because there's not a, like a clearly defined path where this country's ship gets righted. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I just see a lot of chaos and, and a lot of confusion and a lot of infighting. And I don't know how this plays out. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like there's a real clear, oh, this is our path to sanity. Uh, you're right. And I think the first step towards that path, though, is people recognizing what the insanity is and, um, and, and the problems. Um, and I think that more and more these things, these things are coming to light. The word agriculture comes from agrarian, meaning the soil, and culture, the enrichment of soil. Yet today, modern industrialized agriculture is a system that destroys soils, extracts soils, minerals, and degrades soils and erodes soils. We have lost touch with the natural systems of the culture of soil. Topsoil is the layer that allows plants to grow and is decreasing at an alarming rate because of soil erosion. Most of the main crops of the world are eroding soils at 200 tons per acre per year. This cannot go on because topsoil is the basis of life on Earth. If we look at the present world as a species, We've lost touch with the natural systems and industrialized agriculture goes against the laws of nature and we are not separate from nature. To find a solution, we have to look at nature and we have to build systems where humanity lives that is 70% forest cover because it's in the forests that we truly learn and it's the forests that help us to manage our soil's stability and enable that soil to maintain its fertility. The word permaculture comes from permanence and agriculture, but it naturally leads to permanence in culture. It's a system that focuses on solutions rather than problems. It's the art of working with natural systems to create productive ecosystems that provide all the basic needs of humanity. A design science that begins with ethics and mimics natural systems in any landscape, in any climate, anywhere on Earth. Permaculture is the way we go beyond sustainability and into resilience. How would you get permaculture to appeal to massive for mass adoption by people with small acreages? If that makes sense. Like how do you build that mass appeal for people who have small small farms? I think small farms are the answer, obviously. Uh, it's going to be a long time before we can increase the size of farms in time. I mean, we just don't have enough time uh, to get onto large farms. Um, I think starvation is not far away. Uh, famines are not far away. I think we've got to take people through um, a new narrative um, of uh, transformational change. So we have to literally um, Run, run new approaches where we need to take people through this transformational change where they support small farms and they become part of the movement even from small gardens to small farms uh, and they need to sort of realize they're swimming in a toxic suit while they're hypnotized with everybody else and nobody realizes we're all hypnotized most people are hypnotized the masses are hypnotized and they're swimming like a big crowded shoulder fish, all swimming in the same direction in a completely toxic fluid. And I think you have to 
ask people just to step out of the water, just get come with me on a, on an exercise where I can get you out of the water and you can look back and see what it is that your how how your existence actually looks. Because most people are too afraid to step out of the water, although they're in the toxic soup and they're completely hypnotized. They have to trust us that if you just come out of the water and look back at the situation you're in, you're going to look for an alternative. And we have we have the alternatives. And I think that's the point of change. It has to be transformational because people are they're they're they're, they're just asleep, they're hypnotized, and they and and they're just following everybody else. And they're kind of afraid to step out and do and step out to do something different. We don't have to we can't force people to do something different, take a different approach to life. Um, but we can ask them to at least, um, at least for a small amount of time, step out of the water and look at what, what the situation is. And, and if you really want to change, we've got an option and it's very meaningful and it's uh, happier and healthier and, and, and better, for, better for everybody. That's what we need to do. I think it's a mistake to ask if people and make all people the same as one entity, if they will understand it. I don't care if all people understand it. When you're faced with, a, with an overwhelming life-threatening crisis, as in the Titanic being hit by an iceberg, and you happen to be aware before anybody else is that the ship is going to sink and there aren't enough lifeboats. And you know how to build lifeboats. And you try to deal with that in however long the Titanic had before it went down. You're likely to run across three types of passenger on the Titanic. You'll run across a type that's basically deer in the headlights. Uh, ship's been hit. What does that mean? What do I do? I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. Should I do that? I don't know. That's one group. There's another group that says, uh, we get that the ship's going to sink. We get that uh, we're all going to die unless we make some lifeboats and do it fast. Show us what to do. And then you have a third group that says, this is the Titanic. It's absolutely unsinkable, unfucking sinkable. And uh, so we're going back to the bar for a drink, and all you doomsday sayers can actually just take a hike. Now, if you're the one who knows how to build lifeboats, which group of people are you going to help? Bioregional development is arguably the most important aspect of the permaculture movement, in my opinion. It's detailed in the last chapter of the Permaculture Design Manual that was written by Bill Mollison. Um, on page 510, it details bioregional organization as a bioregional association of the residents of a natural and identifiable region. This region is sometimes defined by a watershed, sometimes defined uh, by remnant or existing tribal or language boundaries, at times by town boundaries, suburban streets, or districts, and at times by some combination of the above factors. Many people identify with their local region or neighborhood and know its boundaries. There is an obvious conflict between the need to live in a region in a, a responsible way, by a regional centrality, and the need to integrate with other people in other places, global outreach. We need not only to think globally and act locally, but to act and think globally and locally. Um, essentially, what it does is detail hundreds of critical jobs that would be required to self-sustain in a community. So it is tribal-like. Um, essentially all your needs would be met locally. So that includes medical, clothes, building materials, you know, nurseries, elderly care, tree nurseries, there's look there's hundreds of jobs and these are the jobs that are 
our schools and colleges and universities need to be distilling down and injecting into our kids that they're not training them for the jobs of the future. These jobs have been marching us all into a workforce that's been by and large deeply destructive. Um, and if we ever want to rebuild our middle class and to restore our mom and pops and find a job that garnishes some sort of self-interest and sense of meaning to an individual, uh, if we don't want to be rendered irrelevant through AI and shipping our jobs overseas or just automation, then this really is the only game in town. This is the only move that we could collectively make. People that are already set in their ways and have long-winded careers and a high skill of any one thing, you could you can leverage that and point it in the rec the direction of this movement. You know, it, it, if you're a photographer, you could take pictures of it. If you're an author, write a write a book about it or a blog about it. If if you're a teacher, teach this. Anyway, uh, I laid out a very detailed uh, game plan as far as how we could roll this out nationwide. So let's check that out. This is a list of all of the community colleges that are found in my state. There's 15 of them. And what I've done is mapped them out, circled their main campus locations with a 5, 10, and 25 mile radius. If we, if we go after the community college as the, the main central hub to prop up, um, they've got alumni funding, state funding, federal funding, they've got the structures there, they got, they've got the classrooms. But what we could do is we could design and build them an edible landscape to where they, they can teach indoor and outdoor uh, things that pertain to permaculture and other regenerative agricultural techniques. There's plenty of things that they could be teaching. If they taught those things to those students and then the, those students then went out into their local communities and propped up uh, their own jobs, then we can then we can have a circular economy that's centralized around an agrarian lifestyle, and it would be deeply healing to the planet. It would ensure food security, and I think it would build community and it would stabilize a, a very hostile situation that we find ourselves in. So, I think it's a good idea to to um, you know reach out to the permaculture desi designers that are out there in their communities that they might they may or may not have set up a homestead or a demonstration site but if we um, if we partner with those that are already embedded in their communities and we bring this technology and this clear vision of the landscape then they can advise their local uh, their local government officials city planners uh, they can team up with conservancy efforts and forestry efforts, setting up nature corridors. They could be working with everybody who has a tractor to go out and terraform their landscapes so that we can start banking water in the ground instead of pulling it up. Um, so, I mean, we could be deeply impactful if each community was to focus and proliferate inside of that 25 mile radius if every college campus in every state and country then we could um, act in unison almost and rapidly change the situation
going to be giving you all a little tour of the property while I point out some of the key features that we deploy in permaculture design. In permaculture design, we aim to design synergistically with the landscape, not impose design on the landscape. But in order to do that, you have to take several factors into consideration. What are your average temperatures? What's your max rainfall event? Um, what, uh, how is your terrain? Is it super steep? Gradually slope, super flat? Do you have a problem with too much water or is it dry? Um, you know, what's your sun angles? Do you have any south facing slopes? Uh, you know, there's a lot of things to consider uh, when you're designing a proper permaculture design. So, you know, take sun, sun for example. I'm, I'm in this open canopy space here and the sun comes from over here to over here. Um, how, many, how many hours of sun in the day do I have? I'm going to plant annual crops here. I'm going to plant a tree that can handle partial shade. What's the deal? Every, every place you have to make these types of considerations or else you're not going to have very good results. So I'm going to show you some of the tools that I use that are both web-based and uh, apps that you can use on your phone that will help you in that selection process. I put together this Trello board that I share freely with other designers and anybody interested in this information. But it's essentially all of the web-based tools that I use found in one convenient location. So if you're interested in that, you can email me, ben at pearlriverdesign.com, and I'll shoot you a link. Uh, as far as phone based, we'll go over here. Let me grab my phone. One really cool one, Sun Surveyor. I paid like 10 bucks or something once for it, but it's the tool to have. Uh, you just stand where you want to plant something and you can hold it up and you can see the path of the sun. On the lower end, you can see what it's going to be like in the winter equinox and then up here is the southern uh, it's the uh, summer equinox so I know I can see right here that this tree is going to kind of block me from some, some direct sun maybe more of an issue in the winter but not really because the leaves are going to be dropped so these are all deciduous trees right here so winter is not going to be an issue. Summer now, when, the, when there's full of leaves, whatever it's going to be right here is going to be experiencing some shade from that harsh western sun. So that could be a plus. So we have about a tenth of an acre garden here fenced off. It's where we plant our annuals. Just above our uh, tenth of an acre garden space, we have a bunch of bamboo planted in here. Uh, this is black bamboo and I got moso bamboo over there. So it's going to get pretty tall and some uh, evergreens planted in the top swale here. So collectively these two things are going to block north winds that are cold coming in and launch them up and over our garden space here. And over here we have opened up the canopy, dropped some uh, oaks and inoculated them with some shiitake. Over here we have a chicken tractor on steroids that's in the middle of construction. And uh, so it's 10 feet by 60 feet, which is 600 square foot roof. And with our 62 or no six uh, yeah 62 inches of average rainfall that we get every year, that's quite a bit of I want to say like 12,000 gallons or I think it, actually no I think it was like 23,000 gallons that I'm able to collect. As far as inside here, this is this 10 foot by 10 foot space is going to be where I house my chickens. And then I have one, two, three, four, five bays that is going to have 
a one cubic meter pile of compost assembled right here. Um, that's a third manure, third third carbon, and a third greens. We could use our yard waste or vegetable scraps or weeds. Uh, I got some leaves that I'm saving there. I don't have any rabbits at the moment, but I have a little small rabbit operation that we save our rabbit droppings. I have an old freezer under the tree over there that I have vermicompost operation going. And we have manure from some friends' farms. They're cows that we, we like to mix up to make our garden soils. But we're going to have a serious compost operation here. So what we do is we assemble uh, a one cubic meter pile of compost here. And the chickens, they come out and break that pile down. They eat all the insects, all the, all the seeds in there, and they shred it. They, sh they shred it very finely and manure it simultaneously. And what we do is we take that pile and then reassemble it here in the next bay and form up another pile. So week after week, we move these piles down to the fifth week where it's been disassembled and reassembled five times. You have premium compost coming out of here that we can come in from this side with the tractor and pull it out spread it out into our gardens or we can go spread it out to our orchards so it's going to be the heart of our operation here on the farm fertility wise and we'll have you know some meat and eggs it's all good what i'd like to do is tie that water system in to this pond here and then run an outflow past this tree into that open space over there and have a natural pool that's charged by this system here. I wanted to show you another useful tool that I use on my phone. It's to help me with plant identification. And um, it's put out by Caltech University and it uses AI to help you identify plants. So here's an example. Um, this here. It already has it identified as American Black Elderberry. Not really a challenge for it here. Let's see. See if it gets my comfrey. Yep. Comfrey. Let's see if it gets this golden rod over here. Golden rod. Bam. So if you're not familiar with plants and all of the plant families, this is the tool for you. Because in a very short amount of time, you'll just, you'll just remember it. So I also wanted to show you iNaturalist, which is another uh, cell phone software that Caltech put out. Um, What's cool about it is everything that you take pictures with of your with your cell phone, um, it geo locates it. So you can go into your observations here and see everything that you've gone around the world and taken pictures of. Um, and so let me see here. All right. So here's all the places around the property I've snapped. And you can click on any one of these and see them here. Or um, what's cool is you can run a report and it uh, you can export it to Excel and it will list off all the life that you've seen in your uh, on your property. And that's pretty cool for a designer too, because you can send that, or they can log in and just zoom into your your site here. So if you kind of do the homework a little bit and get out there and start snapping up uh, a bunch of pictures, they can zoom into your property and kind of sniff around and see what all is located here. So yeah, it's it's help it's helpful uh, for a designer, especially if they're not local. Okay, so you've identified a plant. Now the question is, what can you do with it? So one tool I like to use to figure out what's up is 
plants for a future. So if you just type in PFAF and put in, let's say Comfrey was one we tagged, right? Comfrey and then hit enter. Bam. Okay. figure out that's where it, where it grows if it's hazardous to you how about uh, where you can plant it how useful is that hmm. the range can you eat it what other uses hmm so if you go scroll down here other uses You know, is it medicinal? What what kind of things is it known to treat? References? See? Pretty handy. So, let's start at the very top of this property here. I'm sitting about 300 feet above sea level. And all the way at the other side of the property, the lowest part is about 40 feet lower. Um, in permaculture, we are actively trying to utilize the water as many times as possible before we relinquish it at the end through entropy, full use. So starting at the top, what do we have? We have water coming off this road and trying to move up against the house. So what we did here is we put a little diversion a little berm here so the water hits this and sheds off this way and flows around to the next berm where it's met with more water coming through here not a lot a little bit but it, it all adds up it collects like little uh, pinball bumpers moving the water through here hitting this other berm before it flows over here and drops into this swale now what do we have here? We have elderberry, we've got bananas over there. This is a pomegranate. Uh, we, one thing to consider here is we have power lines and this pomegranate I think only gets 15 or 18 feet wide. So, you know, seven to nine feet out this way, we'll, we'll have a canopy, but it's still far enough away from the power lines. It's not gonna be an issue. Um, elderberry here. I got some gumi berry, some pawpaw, kumquats. It's, it's all benefiting. I throw, I throw uh, all sorts of leaves and good stuff in here. So the water will fill up in the swale and then flow around to this next berm. And this berm right here transports the water right around to drop into this little frog pond that we've already visited. And uh, it's a simple yet effective. Every, all the trees here are happy. I'm not out here watering them. It's just a, pa a passive way to irrigate your things. So understanding the terrain and how water moves across your terrain is really gonna help you plan smaller little ponds like this or big catchments. Um, the issue is you wanna be sure that you can dissipate the amount of water that's coming at you otherwise it's going to blow out all of your retention structures and uh, be kind of a mess on your hands so some of you might have a, a property map like this but it's not very useful to a designer it doesn't depict any topography or anything really other than your property uh, borders and not that that's not important <laughs> but uh other than your house in, in relation to those borders and roadways you might have some utilities marked on here that's all well and fine but for the sake of designing uh, not very useful uh, some of you might have property maps that have a survey on there where you've got some basic topography going on but it's you'll see uh, I'm going to show you some of my maps and there's there's a lot going on with what I do 
this is the very basic depiction of terrain. Uh, I'll give you a quick little overview of how to read those contour lines. So I've highlighted a contour line. And essentially, a contour line is just a level line. If you were to take a level and put it anywhere on that line, it would read level. So if you dig a ditch on contour, it will hold water. You know, it's nice and flat. If you dug a ditch and it was uh, lopsided on the, on the high end was a foot or two higher than the lower end, the water would just fall into that ditch and then just <laughs> fall right out. Um, so typically we would uh, set up a laser level or a water level or use an A-frame to mark out exact points that are level and then draw a line, spray paint a line, and that's where we would be cutting into with our machinery. So roads can be used to divert water, either to fill ponds or if you want to hydrate another area of your property. But I'm pretty much at the top of this hill. There's a little bit, there's a little bit of hill here that comes in. I used to sweep across this area. And I just had this road put in. There was a lot of erosion here, just from traveling roads back and forth and then water coming across it. So what we did was we cut in a ditch here and put a, we put a uh, culvert right here that comes out and feeds this top swale. So this top swale here is not only fed by this culvert, we also have from the house here we have our kitchen uh, sink, our our uh, kitchen, our bathroom sink, and our bathtub feeds a gray water line that comes in over here and pops in right about there. So this swale will overflow and go into the next one and the next one and the next one and so forth. Eventually, I was pondering maybe putting the pond right in here and connecting another swale that comes in just below our our garden here to wrap around this valley right here and, and dump into a pond I could I can get away with that easy so when we're looking at a topographical map it's it's useful it's informative but um, we don't want to just impose design anywhere and as we're scanning the terrain for potential places to do earthworks or put a building or where to run your animals, you can read the different degrees of slope in a colored way instead of just kind of gauging uh, the proximity of the contour lines in relation to each other. Because if the contour lines are really close together, it means that there's an elevation change over a very short distance. So it's, in other words, it's a very steep drop off. Whereas if the contour lines are spaced far apart, then you have a very gradual uh, de decline in slope. So depending on how that slope is, uh, some places are more appropriate than others to place things. We were out in the yard talking about uh, the, the solar angles and and how do you kind of gauge that with tools and that's all well and fine for like spot observations but to go across your property and, and make a lot of uh, observations like that how do you transfer that to paper or how do you help somebody on the other side of the world understand your landscape in relation to something like the Sun well I have a handy dandy little solar aspect map that I like to include in my package of maps. You can see in the, the slope map that areas that are over 18 degrees are all just colored red. Um, you can look at your own individual machinery but typically like 15 degrees uh, sideways on a on a hill with a tractor is pretty scary. Um, you can easily induce erosion at those slopes so um, for the sake of safety and just holding everything together um, 
for erosion's sake and also letting those places be as kind of a zone 5 undisturbed wilderness area uh, those are good ideas as far as like where do you plant a building or a garden space you typically want uh, a very gradual slope like 0 to 2 degrees um, you can get away with like my garden is above 2 degrees just ideally um, an instant read you can visually go there with your eyes uh, one thing to keep in mind super flat spots are typically in like a, a nice low valley type of a situation so even though it's flat you have to also look at your um, hydrology maps and figure out if there's going to be a lot of water coming at you there or not uh, sometimes you can set up a little diversion above your your head to move the water away from you I show the hydrology in all of my maps but one cool one that I do is a wet dry map where it also shows the kind of the high and dry ridge line areas that would typically be dry and you can devise ways to channel water, water out towards those dry landscapes another map that I incorporate is an altitude map and it just shows uh, the overall change in surface elevation I also include in my map series kind of a, a reduced color map that you can print out and sketch on so for today's presentation I made my maps for Mark's property and I've invited one of my design buddies to come along and provide Mark with a good permaculture overview um, Sam Rosenthal is a plant specialist and animal specialist he's a fellow uh, student of Jeff Lawton's and I had the pleasure of mapping for him from time to time when he's doing his designs I know that was an adventure just about an hour of your time and I hope I kept it interesting enough for you and you learned a little something about permaculture uh, gained a little insight into my mapping and their their value and use in permaculture design and gave you something to think about and something to be optimistic about and something to support um, and tap on your shoulders the shoulders of your friends and family I think that the world is coming around and there's a, a massive disillusionment that's going on uh, while simultaneously there's a bunch of misdirected hostility and nihilism and uh, idle hands and wasted money and time um, but I think it with enough awareness and positive options to lay out in front of people that we can whirlwind this into uh, something that none of us could have ever fathomed uh, to be so um, again thank you for having me here and I look forward to talking with Mark and Sam I don't have to tell you things are bad everybody knows things are bad it's a depression everybody's out of work or scared of losing their job the dollar buys a nickel's worth banks are going bust shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter Punks are running wild in the street, and there's nobody anywhere who seems to know what to do, and there's no end to it. We know the air is unfit to breathe, and our food is unfit to eat. And we sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radios, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to write. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. Uh, ben, Ben, Miss, Miss Simmer, you're asking a lot of questions, Ben. Here we go. Uh, some people are impressed by... Mac MacGyver or Chuck Norris? Nope. 
I, I, I'd rather be stuck in, in a bad spot with Jeff. That's so nice, Ben. I don't get comments like that very often. MacGyver, well, he's my son's hero, Permaculture Tools. He was a MacGyver, my MacGyver led my son.